Well, we'll sort of start moving into the text uh, this week. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll read uh, Jonah 1, verses 1 and 2. And then I'll explain what we're going to be doing today. I have like four or five Bibles that I've studied Jonah with, and they're all super marked up with notes. And when I run out of space, I go to another Bible and put more notes. And then I run out of space there and go to another Bible. And then I've been using uh, the Olive Tree app uh, on my phone. And I started writing notes in there and color coding highlights and all types of stuff. Uh, I got really fancy for this study since I had the time to do it. I was like, well. And now all my notes are scattered. And it's the hard work of now you know, being the, the redactor, you know, and looking for my J-D-E-P Jonah notes, right? Anybody get that? Yeah? Documentary hypothesis? No? No, does everybody just, all right, that's cool. That's okay. A little theological joke there. All right. So let's read Jonah 1, 1 through 2, and we'll pray, and then we'll take a look at what we're doing today. <clears throat> it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, uh, Lord Jesus, Lord, for all your work that you've done uh, for us, Lord, the work that we couldn't done, living out a perfect life, Lord, paying a penalty that we certainly could never pay. Rising to life, Lord, is proof that indeed payment had been accepted and now you sit at the right hand of God the Father ruling reigning uh, governing uh, all of creation all of redemption governing everything uh, to its eschatological end we thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us uh, the life to come already uh, right now we do possess resurrection life Lord we pray that the Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and our minds as we study uh, the word that he has inspired Lord uh, help us to understand it uh, to grasp it, Lord, uh, to meditate on it, Lord, and, and to think deeply about it, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so last week was a, a pretty uh, uh, a methodological, I guess, introduction to how we're going to be looking at Jonah and getting rid of some, uh, some old methods that uh, people have approached Jonah with and trying to you know, give us, in a sense, a fresh approach. Um, and, uh, you know, by fresh, I don't mean anything like, you know, completely new or anything, but just things that have been lost in a, in a sense. You know, in the history of interpretation, uh, the church goes through periods where certain things get emphasized. You know, you can see, I mean, the scientific tale of Jonah started being told when science, you know, was on the rise. And all of a sudden, well, we've got to prove the Bible. And, well, Jonah's an issue. So now, you know, the Bible becomes a tool, you know, for science and, and, and for proving, um, you know, all sorts of uh, scientific theories and, and, and things like that. And just asking the question, in a sense, is it really true and using science uh, as a method? Um, but some of those things, you know, they, they affect the way that we read the Bible. They really do. You know, uh, uh, in one of the lessons that we've had in LAMP, you know, we've seen how sometimes uh, the history of philosophy and, you know, and, and going with, with, the, with Trevor's course too, you know, the history of philosophy kind of starts to govern how uh, the church even approaches theology and how they do theology. So what we learned was Jonah is a very familiar story for many seasoned Christians and children of Christian parents, you know, are definitely familiar with the story, right? Uh, the story can almost seem epic, right? One man alone called to the great city of Nineveh, journeying several hundred miles just to get the message to a large city to save them, right? I mean, it sounds pretty epic, right? I mean, you almost think like, hey, is this Frodo or Jonah? What's going on here? Okay. Now, like any good story, we're introduced to our main characters immediately. So here in Jonah 1, 1 through 2, we're introduced to the Lord. We're introduced to Jonah, and I'm going to take Nineveh as a whole. They're going to be our character number three, okay? We see in the assignment that God is the first actor, right? He's the one calling the should-be protagonist, Jonah, to arise and to go preach to Nineveh what will be a message of repentance, then we're introduced to who, uh, who should be, or, or we're introduced, uh, yeah, to who should be the antagonist by all cultural and theological accounts in Nineveh. So these three characters will be the focus of our historical introduction to the book. And remember, I said last week one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Jonah through 
uh, several different contexts, several different horizons, however you want to call them. So I'm pretty much going to handle those immediately right here and ask you to remember them the rest of the way through the study. Okay, so this is going to be our, our social, socio-cultural uh, introduction, our context, our canonical context to find out where we're at in, in the story of redemption, where, you know, where, Jonah, uh, where we're jumping in, okay? uh, our redemptive historical context, our theological context, and also a missional context that we're going to look at. So we'll start by looking first at the Lord, right? We start asking the questions, well, I mean, who is this? You know, what if I was a, a reader of the Bible and I open it up, I've never read the Bible before, and I open it up to the book of Jonah and I read the word of the Lord, right? Like, well, who's, who's this guy? What's he doing, okay? Why is he commanding Jonah? What authority does he have to command Jonah? What authority does he have to judge Nineveh as evil? What should we expect of this character? Then we're going to look at Jonah, right? Who is this son of Amittai? Who is he? What do we, uh, what do we know about him? What should we expect from this character, too? And then finally, we'll look at what is described as the great city of Nineveh. Who were they? What evils is God talking about when he says that their evil has come up before him? And why does God even care to call them to repentance? So these are some of the questions that we kind of want to start formulating and, and thinking through as we go through the book and, and hopefully answer uh, most of these, but some of these are still going to wait for later lessons. All right. So let's first look at the Lord of the Word. Right now, the Word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Right? These are the first words that introduce the main character of the book: God, the Lord. Who is the Lord? Well, part of the context of the book of Jonah is to understand that this story is part of the middle of a greater story of redemption that has been taking place since shortly after the fall of man. To understand the Lord or Yahweh in this book, we need to know what he has been up to up to this point in the story. So let's go all the way back to the beginning, all right? God created the heavens and the earth. God created all things through the power of his word out of nothing. He made the sky, the sea, and everything in it. He made man and woman uh, who are together. They comprise the image of God. The image of God is especially concerned with the function of dominion that God told man and woman to exert over all of creation as his image bearers. In the ancient Near East, it was a common practice for a king to set up images in the land that they rule. Um, I know I've, I've talked about this one several times, but if you have all have seen The Lord of the Rings, right? Not the movie, but the, I mean, not the book, right? But if you've seen the movie, there's a part where Frodo and Sam, they're, they're journeying, they're on the outskirts of Mordor, and they run into this statue, right? And it's been defaced. It's got the eye of Sauron on it, right? Well, the idea was is that in putting the image of Sauron on there, it was basically a way of saying these lands belong to Sauron. And they put up an image of the eye to say these lands are his, okay? There was an ancient Near Eastern practice in that, basically in the same manner, these kings would set up statues in, their, in lands in various places, and basically that would say this land belongs to this king. Okay, this is his image, and by God, and, and essentially the idea that's trying to be uh, conveyed through Scripture is that God, in making man and woman in his image, and then asking them to fill the earth, is that the image of God, as it spreads throughout the earth, is that God takes dominion through his vice regions. Okay? God tells his image bearers, be fruitful and multiply. And as they fill the earth, uh, they would lay claim to the world and declare that it is God's as they subdued the earth. In another account in Genesis 2.15, it says that God put the man and the woman in the garden and he gave them a mission, right? He gave them work, right? We've talked about that before in our, in our, in our study on covenants. The first thing God did was he gave man a job, okay? Adam, here is your job, right? Fill the earth, okay? Protect it, keep it, nurture it, and grow it. Okay. That is what you all are supposed to be doing. And so what we see, in, in a sense, is humanity on God's mission. Humanity given work by God. They're given his mission. They're not put there and say, hey, do whatever you want. Okay, it's Adam and Eve. This is the work that you're here to do. Make sure we get this done. Okay. And God, having been satisfied with his creation, he rested then on the seventh day to enjoy the fruit of of his own labor, but no sooner than humanity was sent on their mission, they abandoned it. They just let it go, right? 
When humanity sinned, they abandoned God's mission to fill the earth with his rule and presence into the rest of the world. And instead of building up the kingdom of God, they decided now to build up the kingdom of Satan. They joined in Satan's mission. And the Tower of Babel is one, uh, is one of those expressions where humanity, uh, where they're seeking their own mission. And what does the text say, right? That they try to make a name for themselves. Hey, let's build this place up. Let's get ourselves up to heaven. Let's make a name for us. Humanity was on a downward spiral to disrupt and ruin God's plans. However, immediately after man fell, right? I mean, going back a little bit before this, but God had already declared to humanity and to Satan that he would redeem them and his creation. He would do so at great cost to the Redeemer, but it would get done. So God's mission will now include the redemption of his entire creation from the grasp of Satan. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we see the beginning of God pursuing that plan again with the call of Abraham. In Genesis 12 and the call of Abraham, uh, that's the renewal of the mission that had kind of gone away. I mean, you start reading from Genesis 4 all the way through Genesis 11. I mean, the world is a chaotic mess. And I've said it before, but if Conan ever existed as a real character, that's the time that he existed in. Okay? That's the time where he existed. But listen, uh, listen to what God said to Abraham. This is Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, Now... The Lord said to Abraham, or to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in this context, God brings forth the descendants of Abraham in the people of Israel. Abraham was called to blessing in order to be a blessing. He was the gateway for the entrance of of the redemption of God back into the world. All the blessings for the rest of the world would flow through Abraham, through his family, through his descendants. Eventually, God uh, would rescue his people out of slavery to Egypt and then form them into a nation. God formed Israel into a covenant, uh, in covenant continuity with the promises to Abraham. And, And so that is God's mission to bless the nations through Abraham, did not take a back seat to the formation of the nation of Israel, okay? It did not take a back seat. It's not like, I'm going to bless the nations. No, you know what? Never mind. Let me, just, let me just bless one. Let me bless one people, okay? The plan didn't take a back seat. This was part of the plan, in a sense, just as Abraham was going to be the gateway for the blessings uh, uh, into the rest of the world and, and onto the nations. Israel was going to function now as that gateway. That's what they were supposed to be. According to Christopher J.H. Wright, he said, Israel came into existence as a people with the mission entrusted to them from God for the sake of God's wider purpose of blessing the nations. Israel's election was not a rejection of the other nations, but was explicitly for the sake of all the nations. Israel as a nation was called to be a holy nation so that the nations, in a sense, might be attracted to their way of life. If you read in Deuteronomy 4, verses 6 through 8, it says, look, guys, the reason why I have you here is I want you guys basically to function like this light. I've given you guys these awesome laws, okay? I mean, compared to the laws that were around back then, okay? It's like I've given you great laws. You have a great God, and the nation should be able to look at you guys and say, whoa, look at these guys. Look at this nation. Look at the laws that they have. They're very just. They're righteous. And guess what? Look at that. Their God is with them. Their God is near them. Hey, where's our God? Our God's stuck in some statue over there, right? But look at their God. You know, he's with them, you know, as a pillar of fire or a cloud of smoke, something like that, you know?
Yeah, and I mean, there, there's some overlap, I mean, with, with some good laws. Uh, you know, I mean, this is what some scholars think, like the, what's the Code of Hammurabi, um, that they think that Israel based their laws off that. But I mean, there's some common, uh, there's some common revelation that people have. But still, I mean, when it comes to like, you know, just laws and, and, and you know, there are other issues where it's just like, we do whatever we want, you know. Uh, you know, there is some lawlessness. There is some rule of law. I mean, they weren't completely lawless. Um, but their laws, you know, uh, in, in the end, I mean, they're still man-made, you know, and could be broken whenever they want. In, in a little bit, we'll take a look at the Assyrians and we'll see uh, how they liked it. It's like God called the church with, with his guidelines, and it's for the preservation of mankind. People would look to the people within the church and say, God is with them. They are, I mean, I know that the world now is not looking that way, but there are people who still look and say they see the empty work of the church. And so I think that God calls us, his people, as he called Israel to, for the preservation of. Yeah, there, there's, you know, we'll see, there's, with, uh, with Jonah, so there's some continuity, you know, with that, with the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the idea is more people are supposed to be attracted. And then in the New Testament, you start seeing, you know, the going out, uh, a different kind of push. But there's still, there's still a little bit of both. I mean, the, the church is still called to be holy. You know, so uh, was it in, um, uh, I want to say it's 1 Corinthians uh, 14, I believe. But Paul talks about how the, how the Corinthians are handling the worship in their church. And he, he, he mentioned something, and we may miss it if we pass by, but he says so that when unbelievers are there, you know, and that idea is, you know, Paul is kind of presupposing that there are going to be some unbelievers in the church that are going to be visiting, and they need to see, in a sense, the witness uh, of the church in, the, in, uh, in that sort of way. So, yes, uh, so where are we at here? So uh, the idea in, in the Old Testament, okay, uh, there was uh, one of attraction uh, at first, but the promise to Abraham is that through him all the nations will be blessed. So there's already that hint of, yeah, attraction first, but eventually the blessings are going to go out uh, to the nations. So from the beginning, God's plan has always been to redeem mankind through a particular seed. The story of redemption is God's uh, redemption of the nations beginning with Abraham and his seed, Isaac and Jacob, and then their sons and so on, uh, and then narrowing down to Judah's lineage and to David's lineage, uh, eventually to Christ, to the Messiah. God's blessings would not be limited to Israel, but they would certainly begin there. So the question now, who is God, right? Well, God is the creator of heaven and earth. That's the God who's commanding Jonah at this point, right? He's the God of heaven and earth. He's the one who made everything from nothing uh, and made it all good and blessed it. And he's also the offended party as his creatures have rebelled against him, ruining his world and plunging it into deep darkness. But he's also the redeemer who has promised to restore the world and all humanity back to himself through the seed of the woman, the snake crusher. He is God on a mission to bless the nation as he redeems and restores creation back to himself. He's done several acts of redemption up to this point uh, in the story, right? Uh, the judgment of Egypt and the redemption of Israel, right? That's the paradigm of salvation in the Old Testament. I mean, if you asked a Jew in the Old Testament, hey, are you saved? You know, they would look back at the Exodus and say, yes, I am. I, you know, uh, we were saved from Egypt. Back then, that's basically, you know, the way, the way it was in the Old Testament, how they asked. Now, the context is important because as we're going to see, right, Jonah has decided that he doesn't like that mission. Okay? That's what we're going to start seeing from Jonah is that God has a mission. He hasn't abandoned it just because he's been working with Israel and Judah for several hundred years already. It uh, doesn't mean that God has forgotten that plan. But Jonah has decided, as we're going to see eventually, he doesn't like that mission anymore. Okay? He doesn't want to be on that. So let's look at Jonah now, the son of Amittai. He is our second character. It says the word of the Lord, uh, that the word of the Lord has come to him is a telltale sign that he's a what? He's a prophet, right? I mean, a, a, Readers of the Bible at least know that. The words come to him, he's definitely a prophet. Okay, so that kind of starts to put things in our mind already, right? I mean, if you've read other prophets before, you already pretty much know the pattern of what a prophet is supposed to do, right? The word of the Lord came, you know, uh, to Amos or to Hosea or something like that. And what do they do? Okay, so let me take the word to the people. That's the pattern that we should be expecting, right? But, um, you know, uh, uh, 
Well, Jonah's going to be a different story, right? But uh, what little do we know about Jonah? Well, he's mentioned in passing in 2 Kings chapter 14. If you guys want to turn there, in 2 Kings 14, verses 23 through 27, it says this. And you get an idea of his time frame, too. It says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, when he began to reign in Samaria, he reigned for 41 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Again, 2 Kings 14, 23 through 27. Okay? It says, He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border. So here's some of the good things that, that this king did. He restored the border from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. And so Jonah uh, seems to have been instrumental in restoring land back to Israel. Okay, we'll get a little bit more of the context in just a bit. Uh, but Jonah is one of three prophets around this time period too. Okay, uh, he prophesies with Hosea and with Amos. They're also around uh, during his time, okay? Now, when God brought his people into the promised land, they were initially a loose uh, association or federation of tribes with, uh, with no central government structure. Basically, I mean, that's why the book of Judges keeps reiterating over and over. At that time, there was no king. There was no king, okay? There was, there was, uh, there was no unity in that way. Now, eventually, God gave the people a king as they sinfully asked for in Saul. His failure led to the ascension of David, a man after God's own heart, up to the throne of God's people. The capital of the people of Israel was eventually moved to Jerusalem along with God's throne in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, after David's death, his son Solomon ushered in a golden age of wealth and prosperity in Jerusalem. He built the first temple for God, giving God, in a sense, a permanent residence in Jerusalem rather than just living in a mobile home, right? The tabernacle, that's what it was. You you know, you took it down, you put it up. God's living in a tent, okay? And I mean, that was part of David's issue, right? And you know, well, how fair is that? You know, here I am in this great palace, and God, you're in a tent. Uh, I want to build you a house, you know? And then great things start to happen uh, for David from there. But upon Solomon's death, the people realized that though Jerusalem was very wealthy, it was built upon the exploitation of the resources of the rest of the kingdom, right? So, I mean, you read in, in, uh, in Second Kings, he dies, and, uh, you know, his son's about to take over, and the uh, people in the northern kingdoms are like, hey, look, we've been working really hard. We provide all your food. We provide all your, uh, your resources and, and, and such like that. Uh, give us better wages, give, you know, make us a better deal or something. And then what does Rehoboam say? My little pinky is going to be heavier than my father's thigh. I go, okay, well, that settles that, doesn't it? Okay. And so the northern kingdom breaks away. The northern kingdom break, breaks away. Jeroboam takes, uh, takes the lead. And, of course, you know, this comes from the Lord. And, and you know, the, the split is really interesting because they're about to go to war with each other. And a prophet comes and says, stop, this thing is from me. Just let it happen. Right? Let it go. Let it go for now. Now, the north did not have access to the temple or to the religion of Yahweh. Instead, the first thing that this new king Jeroboam did, and we, you continually read, read about him uh, in, in the book of Kings, is that he makes these golden calves. I believe in Dan and, and in Beersheba or some other place in the in Ephraim. And, and he sets up these golden calves all over again and says, here, this is how we're going to do our religion up here. Okay? We don't have the temple. Let's do it this way. And so he's pretty much marked uh, throughout the rest of the Bible, right? The sin of Jeroboam uh, is basically building up the golden calves all over again. Now, eventually, uh, the north, uh, they plunged, you know, headlong into idolatry. And eventually, they became so self-absorbed and they felt entitled to their land and their wealth. Again, we read about that in Amos, right? Those fat cows of Bashan, the women who just, hey, bring me wine, bring me meat, okay? Bring me all my stuff. I want it. Okay, and that's, that's what the north had become, basically. You see, uh, in, in Hosea, Hosea characterizes their sin a lot differently, right? He characterizes it as adultery. But what were they, you know, in a sense, what were they committing adultery with? With all their idols, their materialism, their wealth, and things of that nature. So God's people were in rebellion. They had abandoned their call to be distinct in the land. They abandoned their call to be an attraction for the nations 
to see the glory of Yahweh. They were concerned only with their material and their political lives. Jonah was a contemporary of the prophets Amos and Hosea, again, under the reign of Jeroboam II. So this would place, uh, this would place Jonah somewhere around the middle or the late 8th century B.C. Okay, so somewhere between 786 and 746 B.C. <clears throat> Now, we know about Jonah, too, that he was already a successful prophet, okay? Uh, you know, he helped take back the land. It says at the direction of the son of you know, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the king took back some land. Israel got some land back, and the land is important, right? Because the land contains, it's part of the promises of God. It's part of his covenant. If you don't have the land, in a sense, you're out of the covenant. That's why exile was such a big deal, okay? That's why it was such a curse. If, if you're not in the land, that means you're not in God's promises. You don't have them. So retaining the land signified retaining God's blessings. So not much else is known about uh, the work of Jonah outside of, uh, outside of the book of Jonah or even that little portion uh, that we read about in 2 Kings. At least we can say uh, that he was called to enjoy uh, the privilege of service to God and to his people. Sinclair Ferguson, he says that Jonah belonged to that privileged band of men who stood in the presence of God and felt the pressure of his will upon their spirits, they heard his unmistakable voice telling them what he was about to perform among the nations. So Jonah, uh, I, think he, we, I think it's fair to say that he had a sense of destiny as a prophet. I think he knew his call. He understood his call. Uh, I think he served well in it. You know, it's a faithful word, at least uh, in Second Kings that he's mentioned, right? It was a good thing that he did for his people. As a prophet, Jonah knew what he was for in times of darkness. Uh, he was like an anchor for the soul, for God's people. Jonah also had the privilege of spiritual fellowship with God. This was unique in the Old Testament because God did not just speak to anybody. You know, he, he didn't just come around and say, hey, let's chat for a little bit. He only came to certain people. And so it was a privilege. You know, when you read the word of the Lord came to Jonah, that was a very, very high privilege to have at that time. So that's basically, you know, uh, what we know of Jonah. Some scholars believe that Jonah may have emerged out of the school of prophets with Elijah uh, and, uh, and Elisha. Okay, uh, regardless uh, of what we know, he he had the word of the Lord. We don't know. It just says the word came to him. So, I mean, it could have been something audible or, uh, you know, um, in a good Presbyterian way, just a strong impression. <laughs> All right. Um, something, something like that. Yeah, it could have been Facebook, right? Hey, God's, uh, God's uh, writing on my wall again. He wants me to go here. Um, you know, we, we don't know, I mean, exactly, you know, how that happened. But, you know, uh, I think with, you know, with what Sinclair Ferguson said is, at the very least, it was definitely unmistakable. You know, there was no, hey, this is heartburn. <laughs> don't worry about it, right? I was, uh, don't got to listen to that. You know, there was an unmistakable element of it uh, where they knew that God was talking to them. So, you know, uh, what that feels like, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about Kenya, but how do they, as far as knowing that it's prophet just from God, there's also there's false prophets. So how would they? So the test in the Old Testament is if their word comes true. Yeah, so I mean, that's the biggest test. So I mean, sometimes too, though, I mean, I mean, I can imagine the attitude of some of the people, right? They hear this prophet preach and they're like, well, we'll wait and see if your word comes true. It's like by that time, it could be too late, right? You either listen or you don't at that point. You know, uh, some of these people seem to have been, they, they seem to have been established, you know, too. So I mean, uh, like with the school of the prophets, if they already have, um, as I said, they already have some credentials behind them, basically. Um, so... Yeah, Hananiah. Yeah, and so, see, that's where, I guess, you know, where some of the battle would be, right? Like, well, do we listen to this guy or do we listen to this guy? And at that point, you know, the people, in a sense, they're from there, it's what are their desires telling them? You know, do we want peace, comfort, and security? Or, you know, do we want the fact that God may really take away our temple from us and send us off to exile? You know, can I really examine my life and say, you know what, man, we probably do deserve these curses, you know? I, I guess you can help us uh, know the better education if, if he's a true prophet, if he's going back to the whatever written law there was at this point. Yes. And if it's a false prophet, you have to be like, tell me the stuff that's always coming. 
Yeah. So, so part of, you know, one of the, one of the strengths, um, in a sense of the book of Deuteronomy is it's got a fuller listing of curses. And some of the curses that are listed in there is, you know, if you're disobedient, and in Leviticus are here too, you know, if you're disobedient, you know, I'll start sending plagues, I'll start sending famines, I'll start sending wars. But guess what? Eventually, after I'm done sending those, it's exile time. Okay? And I'll kick you out of the land. And so in one sense, you know, matching that way, I mean, the regular people didn't have access, uh, you know, to, they weren't walking around with scrolls or, you know, Bible apps or anything like that. So they had to, had to memorize, and so they had to know. Right? They had to know. And the prophets, I've heard with the prophets a lot of stuff that they said was not very new. It was just application of the law of God, the consequence, the blessings, and the curses. They were just applying it to their times. And basically saying, look, the time has come for Deuteronomy 28 to, to you know, start being acted out. Guys, this is just, you know, uh, Daniel. Hey, there's one, right? I mean, the 70 weeks, the sevens, and all that stuff like that. He's just basically spouting off Leviticus 26, I believe. You know, he said, I will punish you seven times. I'll punish you seven times. Not good enough? Seven more times. And so, you know, the punishment in exile was 70 years. And so when God comes to Daniel and says, it's gonna, or, or the angel, he tells him it's going to be 77s, what's Daniel being told? He's basically saying, your people are still not repentant. I don't care how much exile you've been in, you know, and how much you miss the temple and stuff like that. You're still not repentant. So guess what? Seven times more punishment is about to happen. So yeah, so there is that application of, in a sense, the Old Testament, uh, the law, you know, back this way, and uh, that's a good guide, and, you know, that would have been a good guide for them to judge, and again, did they know it? We don't know, I mean, remember Deuteronomy was lost for some time, and then they had to find it again, like, oh, we've been, <laughs> we've been out of policy for a long time here, <laughs> let's, uh, let's pick this back up, right? So, yeah, that's a good question, I mean, you, you know, because, I mean, Jonah's coming, it's like, well, who's this guy? You know, I mean, what, what has he done? You know, and God calls, uh, was it Amos? I mean, a shepherd, right, of Tekoa, something like that. Uh, so does that mean Amos just walked fresh in off the field? Hey, I got a word for you guys. It's like, well, who are you? <laughs> Where have you been? You know, you haven't done anything. We don't know you. So definite good, good question there. So finally, let's look at the great city, right? Nineveh, that great city. Well, what's so great about Nineveh? Right? Why is this city even on God's radar? And God calls it great. Okay? I mean, it's not like the city's exalting itself at this point. I mean, God's the one saying, hey, this is a great city. It's an exceedingly great city. I mean, these are God's words about it. So to begin with, Nineveh is one of three important cities in the rising Assyrian Empire. Okay? By the time of Jonah, uh, Assyria had already established itself as a world power. Syria... Okay, so not to be confused, right? They're Syria. They are the power on the way out. The Assyrians are the power on the way in. Okay? Some believe that uh, the Assyrians were the very first to use psychological warfare. Okay? They had very cruel and very violent uh, tactics. Uh, they were, uh, I mentioned last week, but, you know, by all accounts, they were a terrorist state. Okay? They, they really were. Uh, history has recorded the atrocities of many of the rulers of this great city. For instance, these are the words of Asher Nasir Paul, uh, who ruled Assyria from 885 to 860, and these are his words. Okay, We, we have these in uh, little tablets and pillars and stuff like that, but it says this. He says, Great number of them in the land of Kiri I slew. 200 of their 60 fighting men I cut down with the sword. I cut off their heads and I formed them into pillars. Right? A little early Dracula stuff there, right? Vlad the Impaler. Uh, Bubo, the son of Buba, I flayed in the city of Arbela and I spread his skin upon the city wall. A lot of boasting, huh? More words. I flayed all the chief men who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skin. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled upon the pillar or upon the pillar and on stakes, and others I bound to stakes round about the pillar. Many within the border of my own land I flayed, and I spread their skins upon the wall and cut off the limbs of officers, of the royal officers who had rebelled. Ahiababa I took to Nineveh, I flayed him, I spread his skin upon the wall of Nineveh. Last one. 
Six hundred of their warriors I put to the sword. Three thousand captives I burned with fire. I did not leave a single one among alive to serve as a hostage. Their corpses I formed into a pillar. Their young men and maidens I burned in the fire. Three thousand of their warriors I put to the sword. Many captives from among them I burned with fire. Some I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers. Of many I put out the eyes. I made one pillar of the living and another of the heads and bound their heads to post tree trunks round about the city. The great city of Nineveh. Um, I have seen the movie 300 many a times. <laughs> um, the image, if, if you all have seen it, uh, there's an image uh, where, uh, where, where these soldiers, they come into a town that's been burned uh, by the Persians. Um, but they show this tree with dead bodies like all over it. And that's pretty much kind of how I picture the Assyrians and their violence and their atrocities, the things that they did. Okay, but I mean, uh, apparently they loved skinning people. Okay, and they loved putting their skins up on the wall. All right, a little Hannibal Lecter action or something there. All right, but they, they were not nice by, by any means at all. And even, uh, you can see how, you know, one of the accounts, he says that I killed the people you know that were even within my own ranks if they if they rebelled against me if they didn't listen to my commands i took them out and so that city was ruled with fear there was a lot of violence in that city you know does everybody think of it's in, it's in modern day iraq or uh i believe iraq yeah somewhere somewhere near iraq yes yeah, so if I remember correctly, the track would have been about 900 miles for Jonah to make, right? Arise, get up, take a flight, go to Nineveh. <laughs> like, go walk, you know, ride 900 miles. Okay. Um, so it, it, this gives you an idea, you know, I hope, I hope you start to see, you know, when in Jonah 1, 2, when it says their evil has come up before me. That is part of the evil that has come up before God. The culture of the Ninevites, it was one of boasting in their violence and in their cruelty. I mean, you see the records that's left just by one of their kings. I mean, what's he writing about? You know, he's not writing about, you know, wisdom and how to rule and things like that. You know, he's no Marcus Aurelius or anything like that. You know, he's basically, these are my war exploits. This is what I did. This is how I, you know, cut them up. I slayed them this way. Put them on the wall, you know, sold posters. I mean, all types of horrible stuff. This is that great city of Nineveh. It was the Assyrian ruler, also Ar uh, Sargon II, who eventually sacked Samaria and who destroyed the kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. So the Assyrians, this is something we need to know, right? And Isaiah had already been prophesying about this too, right? The Assyrians are the ones who are going to come and handle Israel. They're going to be God's uh, uh, instrument of justice against the idolatrous northern kingdom. That happened in 722 B.C., but Nineveh, it, it joins the company of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in whose evils has come up before the Lord. So Nineveh is not a nice place, nor are they nice people. And, you know, we learned they're enemies of Israel. I mean, the only reason why Jonah was actually able to instruct the king, hey, let's go take that land back, is because it, Assyria was busy warring with somebody else. And they were distracted. And so basically while they were distracted, it was kind of like, you know, let's go capture the flag, right? Let's go get our land back. They're not looking. Let's go back and go get it. And that's what they did. But, you know, Jonah knew. I, I think Jonah had, you know, enough company with, uh, with uh, Amos and, and even hearing the uh, possibly the words of Isaiah, you know, to know, hey, these people are the ones who are going to be the end of Israel. They're, they're going to be the ones, okay? And God sent... Uh, Jonah on a mission to preach to them and to call them away from their violence. Um, I've been reading a book. Uh, it's called uh, Exclusion and Embrace by Miroslav Volf. It's really, really interesting. I'm about halfway through it, but Miroslav Volf is a uh, a Croatian theologian. And if you remember uh, some of the wars that happened over there uh, with, the, with Croatia and, and Serbia and stuff like that, a lot of ethnic cleansing, um, things of that nature. But one of the things that he that that at the beginning he mentions. Um, he had just given a, a lecture, I think it was, you know, going for his PhD or something, and he talked about the love of God and forgiveness and stuff like that. And his professor, knowing he's a Croat, says, 
could you embrace a serve? And he says it shook him. He says it shook him down to the core because of what you know the serves had done to his people, what he had seen in his own cities and things of that nature. He said it just shook him down to the core. Could I embrace a serve? After giving that great, awesome sermon on forgiveness and the love of God on the cross, now you're asking me to embrace a serb. And he said, he said it rocked his world. And the, the book, Exclusion and Embrace, is basically his response to, you know, well, how do you deal with that? Um, but this is kind of what we're starting to see in Jonah. I want us to see that, right? Because Jonah is asked to go and basically embrace his enemies and offer them the repentance of God and offer them a path back to life. And so the issue that Jonah is going to be dealing with is, can I do this? And we've already read, and this is why I said we started at the end of Jonah last week. I want us to understand, as we get into the text, Jonah's angry. He's not scared of these people, as bad and wicked as they are. Jonah's not scared of these people. He's angry at God, offering them a way back in to life. So this is part of our introduction to the book of Jonah, to its main characters. Uh, next week, we do start getting into, uh, into the nitty-gritty, I guess we could say. Uh, any last questions? We've got about one minute. Anything? There, there are some, there are some parallels that uh, that can be drawn. You don't want to press too many of them. Uh, you know, Saul was in charge of, um, you know, uh, leading, I guess, the death squad. You know, to go hunt down Christians. You know, Jonah wasn't. You know, so, I mean, there's some difference. Did Jonah have murderous, you know, thoughts? I mean, sure, definitely. You know, they were there. He would have rather seen Assyria perish. I'm like, what? I mean, that's why he's outside the city at the end, right? He's waiting for the fire to come down. You know, just pops the chair down, sits down, and says, "Yeah, any minute now, it's gonna happen. Any minute now." Any minute now. Need some shade. What's going on here? Okay. Um, the the other thing, you know, what we don't see in the book of Jonah is Jonah's repentance or conversion. I guess we could say that. that's one thing that's missing. With Saul, you know, we see it. You know, he's he's knocked off his horse. Saul, Saul, why you're persecuting me? You know, uh, but we don't see that with Jonah. Now, right? Is it there? Well, I think so. But how it's there, we'll we'll talk about that one when we get to the end. Okay. But yeah, there are definitely some parallels. We just have to watch where, you know, where, where they connect, but also where there's the discontinuity uh, as well in, in the stories as far as what they were doing. Okay. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for your grace, Lord. We, we thank you, Lord, uh, for what you've been doing, Lord, in all uh, of history, Lord, that you've been governing and guiding all things, Lord, to redeem your people, Lord, to redeem your church, to renew, Lord, uh, the entire creation. Lord, help us as your people um, to remember that, that, uh, that we're on your mission, Lord. We're not here, um, we're not here to make our own missions, Lord, uh, to make our own names great, but to make your name great, to make your name known, Lord. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.